So uh, I dis discuss this qu this question: If I have x in affine space, then I can define the tangent space x p uh, uh, it's defined in terms of of uh, df by dx i f in sorry I'm going to go back to this n f in i x Okay, and then we saw that uh, it's actually you know, equal to, or it's dual to, it's the dual vector space to uh, this mp mod mp squared, where mp is uh, maximum ideal of p in uh, k of x affine <coughs> so we're concerned with uh, the dimension of this txp and in particular i want to talk about uh, i want to talk about uh, x a non singular curve So let me, let me, just for the moment, not worry too much about what the definition of dimension is, but let, let me take uh, uh, x is uh, irreducible and dimension x equals 1. I'll say a little bit more about this uh, in just a while. And uh, let's, uh, let's consider this condition that, uh, so p in x is non-singular, and this means that the tangent space Px, t xp, or mp over mp squared, is one-dimensional. So this means I've got mp in k of x, so this is the uh, affine coordinate ring at the moment. <coughs> and this means I can take one, I can find one element, say x, so, so that uh, x generates m modulo m squared. Okay, so this is so far so good. Uh, um, so, so I want to go from this. So this is the uh, affine coordinate ring. And I, as, I, as I've explained, though there is k of x the function field of x which is the field of field of fractions of this and there's also this contains also these local rings o x p so this is the local local ring at p and uh, so just to write out the definition again uh, o x p is the set of g over h in k over x, k x, such that uh, regular at p, so there exists a representative with h at p is not zero. Okay, so by definition, this is contained inside Kx. So whatever else it is, it's certainly an integral domain. <coughs> uh, 
And so uh, I, want to, I want to explain that if, if, we assume, if we assume that this uh, affine, uh, if, so, so non-singular, so P, P and X non-singular, so this means that the affine, affine uh, MP over MP squared is uh, generated is one dimensional and that implies uh, actually it's uh, equivalent to but let me just discuss the implies at the moment that uh, M the MP so l let me let me you know I have only one notation for two different things here so let me call this one uh, um, the local MP, so that this is M prime P in OXP. Okay, okay, I can do that. I can do that. I can write. Uh, MP times OXP inside OXP is a principal idea. Okay. So here I was careful to say this m over mp squared is one dimensional it means I can find one element that generates m modulo m squared. So here I'm saying more. I can say that this, this, actually, this guy is actually generated by just one element. Okay. And so this is one of the defining properties of a, one of the uh, equivalent defining properties of a, a discrete valuation ring. So this will give uh, di discrete valuation. So let me just uh, let, let me just sort of try and summarise information about uh, about these things. So first, local ring. So in commutative algebra, people write a comma m. So this is a, a ring with a unique maximal ideal. Right, so uh, to say this as a unique maximum ideal means that if I take anything in, in the ring which is not in M, then it's invertible. So A away, take away M is invertible. All X in there is invertible. Right, or it's the, uh, it's the, the same thing as saying that uh, all the non-invertible elements form an ideal. So if you think about the ordinary rings you know, for example the integers, then uh, uh, you know, for example 2 is not invertible and 5 is not invertible, but I take some combination of them, for example 2 times 5 minus 2 times 2, and I get something which is invertible. Right, so this is a this is a characteristic property. This means that if I take so in a ring, every element, every non, every element which is not invertible is contained in some maximal ideal. These local rings have just a single maximal ideal, right? And so the normal way of making this is to localize, is to do this thing, is to say I'm taking a ring I know. In this case, I'm taking this ring kx that I know. And I'm making invertible everything that does not belong to uh, uh, a maximal ideal. Right? So this is a key notion in commutative algebra. If you do commutative algebra, you spend most of your time working with local rings, and uh, you use this notion. Right? So DVR. Discrete valuation rings. So there are many, many different uh, equivalent characterizations of this. So I have a little book called Commutative Algebra. I give a chapter where I quite deliberately give two equivalent, uh, you know, an if and only if statement, saying statement A and statement B are equivalent. Atien MacDonald have a little textbook, which is in some ways even more famous than mine, 
uh, and they have about 10 different uh, equivalent definitions. So let me say, let me, let, 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 let me say what, so, so the thing, I won't say this is a, it's a different equivalent definition. So I'm not going to give them all. I can't remember them all to start with. But uh, uh, one is I've got a I've got a, a ring. So a ring A, uh, which is Noetherian. So I explained earlier in the course what Noetherian is. In commutative algebra, essentially all rings are always Noetherian. So uh, we're only interested in Noetherian rings. And non-Noetherian rings are sort of very bad. So uh, I'm working with an Ethereum ring, which is local, so I just explained that, and so that the maximal ideal is principal. Right, the maximal ideal is generated by just one element. So that's the, that's the thing that we, we, we get out of, that we will get out of this. I have to, I haven't, I'll explain the proof of this. Uh, a little later. Right, so that's one. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll say a domain, integral domain. It's true, I think it's true without that, but uh, it has to be. Anyway, anyway let, let me just leave it there. Okay, and then uh, a subring, it's a subring. Uh, of a field. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, uh, uh, defined by. Okay, okay. Let Let me. Uh, So a valuation, so a discrete, a discrete valuation of a field, field K, is a homomorphism, uh, is a map. So I'm writing valuation from K into, I'm going to write here, Z union infinity. Sending, uh, you know, uh, some element there, f, into v of f, right? And uh, v of zero <coughs> is infinity, right? So, so the infinity there is just to do with this, uh, with this. Um, so, and <coughs> such that. So, I want v is a homomorphism. V of multiplicative groups. V of a product FG is V of F plus V of G. And then I want that V of F plus or minus G is uh, greater than or equal to the minimum of V of F V of G. Okay, so I'm being an algebraist. I'm, I'm uh, you know, we're just doing algebra at the moment, so I can write down any definition I like. Uh, let's say that, uh, so then, uh, if I write A, AV, to be the subset of elements uh, F in K, such that V of F greater than or equal to zero, Okay, I'm sorry, I want this surjective. So I take the set of guys, F is greater than zero, and I take, inside there I take MV to be the same thing, F in K, such that V of F is greater than or equal to one, 
then AV, AV is a ring, and MV uh, is a maximal ideal. <coughs> right, and this is called the discrete valuation ring. Okay, so uh, uh, these two conditions here imply that, right? Because if I've got uh, if I've got f g in A, so we're 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 inside a field. We're working all the time with things inside a field, right? So if I take f f and g in A, and then I'm going to take f g. So I don't have to define the product, the product is already defined, it's the product in the field. Right? The thing that's a question is whether or not this condition V of F is greater than or equal to whatever. Right? And this is just uh, because it's homomorphism. So if this, this guy is greater than or equal to zero and this guy is greater than or equal to zero, then the sum is greater than or equal to zero. And then V of uh, F plus or minus, F plus or minus G, uh, well, uh, you know, it's also greater than or equal to zero because it's greater than or equal to the smallest, the minimum of these two. Right? And then MV is an ideal. Right? Just because the same thing, this condition here, means if I take something with greater than or equal to zero and something with greater than one, and I take the product, then I get something greater than or equal to one. And here, uh, additive group is the same. I'm going, always going to get greater than or equal to. Okay, so, so this is just similar. So, so these arguments are very, very trivial. They're just uh, making sure that the definition makes sense. Yes. So, uh, uh, you know, the examples. Uh, the examples you should think about is. Uh, so, so, you know, this, this idea comes from number theory. So, if I take Q and the prime number P, so prime integer, right, then I can, I can, so I, I take any element in Q and I can write him as, uh, you know, um, I want to write him as m times p to the alpha divided by n times p to the beta. Right, so I'm taking a non-zero element here. Yes, OK, I should say. So, so you know, this guy includes zero. Uh, because v of zero is infinity, and so z infinity is greater than everything, right? And so here I'm taking I'm taking this q. I'm taking some non-zero element there, right? And I can write him as numerator divided by denominator, and then I can uh, arrange that m and n are invert uh, are, are not n not co prime to p. Right, and then so, so let me just write this as times p to the alpha. Right, and so this alpha is the. Uh, in this case, so I take this integer f. I take uh, sorry, I take this rational number f. So he's this m over m over n. M, m and n have nothing to do with p, and then times some p to some power. This maybe p to a positive power or p to a negative power, and then I define. Uh, define valuation at P of F is this alpha. Right? So if I take the product of two of these guys, then this exponent of alpha just behaves additively. So that's why I get this, uh, that's why I get this additive property. Right? On the other hand, if, uh, if, I take, if I take the sum and the product, the question I'm asking here with this V of uh, uh, v of the, so 
if you think about doing V of F plus G, then usually these two, these two guys have different values of alpha, and so, you know, I have to, in order to write the sum F plus or minus G in this form, I have to put them to under a common denominator, and the common denominator is uh, P to the, sm to the smaller of these two alphas. Right? So, um, you know, if, for example, if both of these are negative, if both of these have P in the denominator, then uh, I have to, in order to make, in order to get an expression like this, I have to multiply through by uh, the smaller of those two denominators. Right? And then I get a number here, which is... Um, uh, so this is greater than or equal to the alpha for f and the alpha for g. Right? It's greater than or equal to the minimum of these two. So if these alphas are po both positive, then what I'm asking is how many powers of alpha divide f? Right? How, how many times does f vanish at the prime p? Right, so if I've got f plus g, then it vanishes at least the minimum p alpha p beta times, if alpha and beta both positive. Anyway, you, do, you have to think about this, but uh, it's, uh, it's not very difficult, and uh, this is clear. Right, or an alternative way of saying this is that v, vp, vp of f equals alpha means it happens if and only if f times p to the minus alpha is in uh, the valuation ring, a, a, v. Is in, so this is q, a set of q uh, with no p in the denominator. So it's a set of f in q such that no p in the denominator. And this is a ring. If there are no p's in the denominator, if I add to a, if I add or subtract elements with no p in the denominator, I still get some element with no p in the denominator. So that makes this uh, argument very simple. Okay. And so this question here of divisibility, we're asking, given a given a Given a rational number, it's the, the, the quotient of two numbers, the quotient of two integers, and then for, it, for the top and the bottom, I can ask, what is the biggest power, what's the power of P that divides that? And so this valuation is measuring the power of the, power of the prime P that divides F, or more precisely, divides the numerator and denominator of F. So we're going to ask the same thing for rational functions on a curve. So, um, you know, this is similar to uh, so f, a meromorphic function of z, and then I'm asking for uh, v of f equals uh, the, the order of zeros of f minus the order of poles of f. So at, at, uh, at p, uh, at a fixed point. So this is at p. Okay, so this is something you've seen before in complex analysis. I've got something which is given to us as a meromorphic function. So at any point, maybe it has a pole. If it has a pole, the pole has some order. So, so and if I take p to be 0, I'm asking for f looks like z to the power of v times a unit, times a function with no zeros and no poles. Right? So this is what evaluation is. Evaluation is measuring what power of this generator, this generating function, simplest function with a pole of order, with a zero of order one, what power of this z divides the numerator and denominator of f? 
So this, uh, n this uh, uh, you know, numerical, this uh, in rational uh, arithmetic example is really, is really the, uh, the key motivation. Okay, so you know, if you want to see what a stand, more standard commutative algebra textbook says about this, then look up uh, at Ian MacDonald, or look up uh, Matsumura's textbooks, or look up uh, anyway. There are lots of different textbooks in commutative algebra that do this. Let me ne let me now give the argument for um, uh, one implies two. So so this is one, and this is two. Well, this is this is two here. Okay, so uh, so I've got a, a local ring. It's an integral domain. Noetherian and the uh, maximal ideal is generated by one element x. Okay, so I'm going to think of A, and I'm also going to think about the, uh, the, the field of fractions of A. Right, but first of all, let's just think about A. If I take any element F in A, and I can ask the question, is, is F, in, F in M? F, I'm asking the question, is it true that F is an element of the maximal ideal? So if not... If not, then f is a unit. F is, f is uh, an invertible element of the ring. Right? That's because m is the unique maximal ideal. So m consists exactly of the elements of A that are not invertible. Right? If so, the, the alternative, these are just two, two alternative things. If so, then f is x times f1, so. Right, and then same question for F1. Right, so eventually I'm going to get, therefore, just following this argument as many times steps as we need, therefore F is X to the N times Fn with Fn a unit. So here I better assume that F is not zero. And uh, so why does this, uh, if, if, if F is not a unit, then it's divisible by x. Right? That's just saying that the maximal ideal is generated by one element. So if, x is, if f is not a unit, then f is in the maximal ideal, therefore f is a multiple of x. And so then I get this f1. And having got the f1, maybe I get an f2, and then I get an fn, and so on. Why does this finish? Because the ideal f is contained in the ideal f1, is contained in the ideal f2, and so on. And so, a Noetherian. Right? So, at some point, this chain has to break off. And the only way it can break off is if this Fn is a unit. Right? Now, if I take anything in the field of fractions of A, then it's just the quotient of two of these guys. So if I've got, uh, you know, if I've got some F in K, then F is G over H. L let me always say not zero. Right? Then F is G over H with G and H in uh, K, uh, in A. And then, you know, I have G is, uh, you know, some power X to some power, uh, you know, N1. Uh, I don't know, N times g n and h is x to the m times h m with uh, g n h m units and therefore f is x to the power of n minus m times a unit. Right. So, uh, n I, you know, I, in, in this, arg I'm, I'm, this argument is a little bit repetitive, 
but the only thing it uses are these algebraic things. Right, so we don't need any, we don't need to understand what the ring is. We don't need to know anything at all about the ring except it, the axioms it satisfies. So we're doing abstract algebra. And so the conclusion here is that uh, these conditions here, star implies that there is a function from the, from the field K into Z union infinity defined by uh, V of F, this is V, V of F <coughs> equals the V such that um, F is X to the power of V times a unit. Okay, and then you see easily that this is a discrete valuation. This is a so uh, you know as I as I hinted here when we when we're talking about these meromorphic functions of a complex variable, the thing we're doing is counting zeros and poles. So when I start doing the theory of algebraic curves, then that's exactly what I want to do. I want to talk, I want to count the zeros and poles of rational functions on the variety. Okay, so uh, first of all, I, I, before I can do that, I, I need to explain this, uh, this proof. And I had its maximal ideal x, maximal ideal, ma this is the maximal ideal at point p. So this is a local, uh, this is a affine coordinate ring. And I had x, a non-singular curve, means that there exists an x in m so that uh, x generates m modulo m squared. Right, so now I'm going to go to OXP. So that's the local ring. So, so as I explained, it is this it's this ring here, it's, frac it's fractions of elements of this ring where the denominator does not, is not in MP. So this is a set of, uh, you know, whatever it is, F equals G over H, with H not in MP. <coughs> so I said this several times, uh, you know, this is a, of course an equivalence class and you have to worry about you know, there exists an expression such that and so on. So I want to say that this implies, so this, the condition, the condition that uh, m mod m squared is one dimensional implies that uh, the maximal ideal, so the m, mp primed so this is the local, the local maximal ideal. This is O X P times M P. <coughs> is uh, generated by X. The, the, so so this is just the same X. So let, let me draw a pic. Let me draw a picture. Uh, so here's here, here's my curve. Here's the point P. Right, and here's the function x. So as far as the affine ring is concerned, this generates, uh, you know, this generates the, the you know, I, I've, I've, the thing I've drawn here is a function that has a zero of order one at the point P. So it generates, it generates 
the maximal ideal of P, provided you don't look at elsewhere, provided you don't look at these points. So it generates M modulo functions that vanish twice there, because I can just throw in any, any old function here. Uh, I could take, for example, the product of functions that vanish there any number of times and don't vanish there. Right? So I get x generates m modulo m squared, but in this case, obviously, x doesn't generate the maximal ideal uh, in, in, the affine, in the affine cardinal ring because it vanishes at these other points. Right? So for this, I need, uh, I need this thing called Nakayama's lemma. So, uh, so I, I, I explained, uh, local ring is a, is a is, um, you know, key, is a central notion in commutative algebra, uh, and uh, it has this thing, very, very, very convenient thing, that Nakayama's lemma. Uh, so, you know, this is trivial, but, uh, 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 you know, it, you, you have to go through it. So the, uh, the statement is that so uh, uh, if I look at this MP primed, which is MP uh, or X times MP. So uh, MP was an element in, the, in here, uh, the X was an element in here. This has this element X. So X uh, generates uh, the MP modulo MP squared. Right, and so X generates also MP primed modulo MP prime squared. So if I take anything in MP primed, then he's some multiple of X plus something in MP squared. And as I explained, we can move the, use this modulo MP squared. I can subtract off anything there to, uh, to get off. I'm not, uh, let me, let, let, let me leave this. I mean, it's an exercise that I haven't done very carefully. So it's, 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 it's perfectly simple. Right, so the, uh, the statement is that if I've got, l let me just do it for an ideal. If I've got I inside A, 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 a local ring. So suppose that, suppose that some elements X1 up to Xn generate I modulo M times I, right? Then X1 up to Xn generate generate I, right? So Nakayama's lemma is uh, also stated for modules and so on, but I, you know, I've, I've already given a statement which is general enough for everything I need. So, so what's the point? I mean, you know, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is in a sense obvious and trivial, but uh, let, me, uh, let me explain what it's about. So, uh, because, <coughs> so proof, so uh, uh, A is an Aetherian, And I need to know that it's local. Yeah, OK, in the theory. Right, so I is finitely generated. So let me write x1 up to xn, and then y1 up to yr generators. of I. 
Yeah, so, I'm, so I'm, uh, I know that it can be written down by f with finitely many generators, so I throw in the guys I've got, and if that's not enough, I throw in some more. Right, and suppose that uh, uh, R is minimal. Then R is zero. Because Uh, let's look at this element yr. So this yr is in i. So I have to use this condition that x1 up to xn generate i modulo m times i. Right, so inside here I've got, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the ideal gener... I've got a times x1 plus, plus a times x. Uh, n, and then I've got plus m times i. Yes, so, uh, so this condition here, x1, or, you know, if you want, generates i mod m times i. So, so here's my i, here's the guy that I really want to be generators, and then here's the guy that we can't control we can't yet control. So, so my assumption here is that uh, these guys here generate i, generate i mod mi. And so, okay, and so I take this yr there, and so, you know, th what, whatever this is, is generated by x1 up to xr, xn, and y1 up to yr. Right, so that's i, and all the elements in M are not, uh, are, you know, these, these things which are not invertible. So, y r equals uh, something in x i, so some combination a i x i with the a i in a, plus some combination possibly b i y i, with the bi in maximal idea. Yes, I'm just reading. I'm just reading the definition. I'm just following the definition here. So my element yi is in this i, and this i I should I should write is equal to all of this stuff. And so the yi is in the left hand side. Therefore, the y hand is in the right hand side, and therefore I can write as a combination of these xi's with some coefficients which I don't, which I can't say anything about, and then some, these coefficients bi, yi times bi, right? And this means that if I do yr times 1 minus br, this is sum of ai xi plus sum of bi y. And now yi equals 1 to r minus 1, right? And so this guy is invertible. This guy is not in, not in M, and therefore he's invertible. Right? And therefore we can omit YR as generator. Right? But if I, if I, suppose, that, if I suppose that R is minimal, then I can't omit anything. So this is a contradiction. So the only, the only possibility is that R is zero. So, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to be able to sort of, uh, you know, swap around between being Geom geomet geometric and being uh, algebraic. I'm thinking of this as saying that I have this, this local picture in mind. Here's x, here's the point p. Here is the function little x. Right? So this little function x does exactly what I want at p, but maybe has some other zeros. 
So he's not generating the, max, the, the maximal ideal in x in kx because of these other zeros. However, if I went local, then I'd be okay. And we're, we're, exactly the place we're using local is here. I'm allowed to divide by anything which is not in the maximal ideal. So I'm allowed to, I'll be allowed to sort of cancel things here uh, by doing this. You, 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 you know, the argument's not trivial. It's not, it's not very difficult and it's very, all of this stuff is standard in commutative algebra, but it's not trivial. You have to think about it. Okay. So that's, uh, so to speak, the, the, uh, the, the preliminary. So, I want to do, uh, I want to do Riemann rock on curve. Riemann rock on C. So I'm going to start with C in Pn. Uh, and now it can be N. Uh, a non-singular projective curve. So non-singular means it's non-singular at every point. Okay, and I have this, this thing K of C is the function field. So the thing I've given myself, by doing all this discrete valuation stuff, the thing I've given myself is that for every point, for every point P in C, there's this valuation map, VP, taking F, taking... Uh, Kc into, into z. So let me take Kc minus the origin, minus the zeros. <coughs> and uh, so I'm mapping it to z. So this is taking a function f into the, the number, the, the, uh, the degree of zeros, the order of zeros. at P minus the order of poles at P. Right? So uh, by, by construction, exactly by this construction, so there exists an X in KC with uh, a valuation P of x is equal to 1. So this is called a local parameter. So, so this is, this x, so, so, you know, this x is a function on C that has a zero of order one at the point P. So at other points, maybe it has zeros, maybe it has poles, I don't know. Right, the thing I do know is, is, is its behavior at P. So, uh, of course, there are many, many local parameters. There's as many local parameters as there are invertible, uh, invertible functions at KC. I'm not worried, but I can choose one of them. Right, and then, and then, uh, every element in Kc, and then every f in Kc is of the form, uh, is of the form f equals x to some power of v, v of f, this is an integer, times a unit, right, times a function, uh, times a, a regular function whose inverse is also regular a regular non-zero function, right? So I've written this down as the local parameter to some positive power if f has a zero or to some negative power if, z if f has a pole times a unit, right? And so to this extent, you know, the, the, the language I'm using involves all this algebra. 
But if we want to think complex analysis, this is the same as a local complex param parameter. Uh, as a local parameter for an algebraic curve. Okay. So now I'm, uh, now I'm in business. So uh, and now, unfortunately, we have to... So, so, so let me say, given f in c, f in kc, this is a rational function on the curve, define, define uh, the, the divisor of f to be equal to uh, the sum taken over all points P and C. So this is a, uh, you know, when, when we write it down in the first place, it's a, a sum over an infinite set, over an uncountable set usually, of VP of F times P. Right, so this is zeros of F minus the poles of F. Okay, so this is uh, this is an inf uh, in principle the, the sum that we're the uh, the set that we're summing over is the set of all points P and C, which, for example, over an uncountable field is an uncountable set. Right, but on the other hand, this uh, there are so F is regular. F and F F to the minus one are both regular. Uh, on a dense open set. Oh, it's a risky dense open set. And so this is a this is actually a finite sum. Right? So let, let, let me write that again. L let me write that again out again. The domain of F and the domain of F to the minus one in C are both risky uh, open. Right. Uh, let me t if, if f is uh, not, let, let me take f not zero. I mean, this is going to happen again and again. Let, let me not, uh, let me warn you that it'll happen again and again. Right. And so uh, a set of zeros in poles is finite. Okay, so, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, already at the beginning of the course, you knew one very good example of this, namely, I take polynomial rings as functions on the complex line, and uh, it has, uh, it's a product of, uh, it's a product of um, linear forms with, multi uh, uh, with to some exponent. So, uh, let me... Just write that down, and these are the zeros of so this is uh, you know I'm e g c equals p one over k, and let me take uh, x an affine parameter. Right then, uh, f in k of x. F is product of x minus alpha i to some n i times a constant. S has zeros alpha i with multiplicity n i. Right, or if I took uh, if I took f in k of x, then f is g over h and uh, similar. Right, and so, so then I'd have a, uh, <coughs> so then I'd have zeros and poles. Okay. So, uh, so this was a definition of the divisor of a function. So, definition of a divisor in general, a divisor 
is a finite sum. Sigma n p p p and c n p in z and uh, only finite only finitely many are non zero. So, uh, you know, why do I need a word divisor for these uh, sums of points? And so, well, you know, I need, a na I need some name for it. Where does the name come from? Well, I explained all of this is uh, motivated by, uh, by, the ar by algebraic number theory. There's a theorem in, uh, a, theorem, a 19th century theorem of, uh, you know, I don't know, Kum Kumar or Dedekind or someone like this, saying that... Uh, uh, in the ring of integers of an algebraic number field, any ideal is a product of prime ideals in a unique way. And so the, and the, the, exponents, that, you know, the exponents that come out, out there are given by valuations. And uh, <coughs> the thing you're doing is exactly analogous to this. Right? So... so uh, the word divisor is motivated by uh, division problems in arithmetic, in algebraic number fields. Right? But anyway, from now on, we're just going to use this. This is the standard, uh, the standard language for... Right? And a pr principal divisor... Principal divisor uh, is... Uh, the thing I had before, div of f for some f in k of c. Okay, so I'm going to make one or two more definitions. I'm not going to say anything more substantial today, but let me let me uh, let me give a, a definition. Let me give a definition which will uh, you know help you, uh, which will help when I come to. Next, next time's lecture. So as I understand it, there are four lectures. There are four remaining lectures this term. There are two lec uh, one lecture on Tuesday evening, and then four, two lectures next Saturday, and then another the following Tuesday. So anyway, let me, uh, let me just continue this uh, defin definition. So now, let's think about C in projective space. And it, there's this ring which I've made a lot of fuss about, homogeneous coordinate ring. Right? And let me take an element in there, F sub A, which is homogeneous of degree A. So here's my curve C. And here's my hypersurface. So here is f equals zero. And what's, what, what do I see? What does the, what's the picture supposed to be? Here's the curve C. And here I've written down the, hi the hypersurface f equals zero. So I'm thinking of the f as course, of course, of coming from k of x1 up to xn, 0 up to xn, some uh, homogeneous form. And uh, so what am, I, what am I doing there? So I'm also taking a form and asking, I'm, I'm also trying to write down a finite set of points on C, possibly with multiplicities. So I want to say what the divisor of FA is. So the points of intersection of F equals zero, FA equals zero with C, with appropriate multiplicities.
So what's, uh, what's happening here? Why can't I just say, well, uh, you know, take valuations. So, so, you know, what are these appropriate multiplicities? Well, the thing I want to do is just take valuations of these, F uh, these FAs. The problem is that's illegal, as it stands. I'm only allowed to take valuations of functions. So how to, how to apply valuation P from KC so minus zero, let, let, let's always say, I always mean minus zero there, into Z to FA. Right? So the valuation is defined on rational functions, and as I've said several times already, this FA homogeneous forms are not rational functions. They're something else. They're rational forms. They're, they're homogeneous forms. And so uh, the answer is, the answer is choose, uh, you know, what I really want to do is choose coordinates and assume that none of these points are in X0. I choose, um, so, so I can say it in several, several ways. Choose a linear form X in the coordinates. So that the hyperplane x equals zero does not contain any of these finitely many points. Does not contain the finitely many points of intersection. Yes, so, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm setting f equals zero here on the projective space and then intersecting with the, with the curve C. So f, I'm assuming that f is not zero here. f is not zero as a, as a form on C. And so that means that, uh, uh, you know, the places where it's not zero is an open, is a Zariski open set, and so what's left over is only a finite number of points. So it's only a finite number of points. I can certainly choose a hyperplane there somehow or other so that it doesn't pass through any of these points. Right, and then, then I'm just going to define the valuation of FA at these points. So then, so if, uh, so X chosen, chosen that way, with respect to a given finite set. Then uh, define divisor of, uh, uh, then divide, define valuation at P of FA to be equal to valuation P at FA divided by X to the power of A. Right? So this gets me out of my problems because this element is in KC. Right? Also I've chosen, so this X, this, this X is somewhere over here, X equals zero. Right? So the X has some other zeros. So obviously I can't use, I can't use that definition at these other zeros, I can, but I can use it at the finitely many points pi. Right, and so this is for the points p in c, take away x equals zero. Right, so this is the divisor. Uh, so I started off by saying divisor is just a finite set. Right? Then I went back to this uh, zeros and poles of a given function, and then I said that's a principal divisor. And now I say I can, define, I can also define this for 
uh, I can also divisor of f a is now the sum. So now let me take only points p in c intersect f a equals zero, and then here write down valuation p at the, at, of this f a times p. Right. And so I can define the divisor also of this. Later on we'll see we can also take, find the divisor of a differential form. So, you know, this notion is, of course, this, this notion here of a divisor is very closely related to the notion of device, uh, principal divisor, but it's not exactly the same, right? So, in particular, I'm putting in this denominator xA, and then I'm not counting the poles of x to the a. So in this, uh, in this, uh, in this game, the game I'm playing there, I'm not putting in these, these, uh, these poles. That's, they're not included as properties of FA. Right? And uh, uh, something you have to see is uh, this does not depend on on the choice of F. On the choice of X. Right, because if I chose some, if I chose some other x prime, also not, also being a, that's a unit at these points, then the ratio x divided by the other x, x over x prime, would be a unit at these points. Okay, so this notion, well, I started off with only principal divisors, and uh, then I know how to f uh, find divisor of f. So I've shown you how to make also the divisor of a homogeneous form. So um, uh, I'm going for Riemann Rock. I'll say at the beginning of next time, the, uh, the whole argument, the whole proof of Riemann Rock is a number of formal steps starting from. Uh, uh, three, uh, two or three, three or four statements that we can take as axioms, and one of the uh, one of these axioms is something that you're you already familiar with in some cases. So uh, this is not what I'm saying is a preview of uh, the start of next lecture. It's not a it's not it's not a logical part of the lecture. So we want the divisor of f has degree zero, right? In other words, I do this thing here, uh, sigma n p, now when I've got this, I can take the degree, I can just take sum of n. So this means, i.e., if, if f, if the divisor of f is some, let's say, NIPI, then some NI equals zero. So this means number of zeros equals number of poles. Okay, so this is something which you already know perfectly well in this, uh, in this case. And also you can prove it using Cauchy's integration theorem. Uh, on, a, on a Riemann surface. So there's nothing very surprising about this. Uh, however, it's not especially easy to prove in, uh, in algebraic geometry. And uh, I'm going to prove it. So proof uses um, the divisor of FA has degree A times the degree of C. Right, and so uh, you know this is Buzu's theorem. This is something like Buzu's theorem. I have a curve C in projective space. It ought to be possible to define a degree d, which is you know the number of the number of points in a general hyperplane section. And having defined the degree d, if I cut by hypersurface of degree of some degree a, then I ought to get a times that degree of point. Right, and uh, so th this is the uh, this is the way this is the way I intend to prove this uh, this main 
this main, uh, main result. Okay, okay so I'll, I'll repeat these, some of these definitions and arguments very briefly at the beginning of next lecture. So the next lecture is on Tuesday evening. So that's, uh, I, I didn't fix the timetable. I'm sorry, it's... Uh, <coughs>